OK, this is going to be based on uh, probably a lot more coding. And I'd like you to the best of your ability to go um, have a long uh, these examples. So I'm going to talk about the Gen5 standard library. Um, so why a standard library? Gen5 standard library is kind of like if you're familiar with a C++ standard library or any standard library in a language. Uh, it's essentially a way of us delivering, delivering uh, commonly used and useful code, or in this case, Gen5 configurations, to the community. So when I started this project back in, well, I started, when I started working in this project, uh, about, about five years ago now, you used to have to literally define every single part of your simulation in order for Gen5 to work correctly. And what I mean by that is you have to uh, construct every single sim object you want to use, and then specify exactly how each of them are connected together, exactly what each of their parameters were, and even to get, I would say, the most basic of systems you can think of working would be hundreds of lines of Python code. And if you got a small error, like you didn't connect one of the ports up correctly, or you got one or two, one parameter was had a typo on it, you could things would crash kind of catastrophically. So Gen5 was very brittle. And what we noticed is this, oh, this, this caused a lot of duplicated code because people just copy and paste code and pass it around. And that was essentially their version of having a Gen5 standard library. Uh, this was very, very error prone. And there was a lack of portability. People would kind of build their own configuration scripts that they developed over years that were hundreds of lines long and just copy and paste it around their projects and they just give that to someone else and it became this like equal system of uh, that wasn't very sustainable. That's why I developed the standard library, it's kind of a standard way of reusing commonly used ideas and codes and things inside Gen5. Uh, so the kind of philosophy here is like there's no we when we say a standard library, we're not trying to, we were never trying to create something where you can just import something and basically have all your research done for you. We were trying to create functions and classes that would allow you to get all the stuff that's typically done, all the stuff that's very common between different simulations done for you. So for example, if you're trying to create a processor consisting of multiple CPUs, that it's common, the code that handles how uh, multiple cores communicate with the memory system in a sustainable way, it's kind of a common problem for every single person who wants a multi-core multi system and how you do that. So we just provide that as part of the Gen5 standard library. You just have to plug into a function how many cores you have, and it'll spit out uh, the same objects and how they're connected together. Um, so the metaphor, I think, that's best, that helps you best understand how the Gen5 standard library works is by thinking of it as literally you've got a board, like a motherboard in front of you. The motherboard exposes APIs uh, connections, and if you find a component that fit conforms to that API, that connection, you can just plug it in. So you've got, oh look, you've got this sort of um, memory interface, and I've got this memory device, it conforms, you plug it in, and you keep doing that until your, all, your, all your sockets that are required are fit, and then you do board.run, and the system boots up. It's like uh, going to a computer store, you buy your motherboard, you buy your memory system, you buy your processor, you buy your graphics card, you buy everything else, and you plug it in. And because all the manufacturers of all these components actually uh, conform to the same uh, sockets and various standards, this works. And the person who makes your graphics card never really has to talk to the person who makes your motherboard because they've all agreed in this common interface in between. And Gen5 standard library is all about this common interface creating a common interface so we can reuse components. If I create a processor inside the standard library, I can use it on every single other board that I've ever created in the standard library, and 
I know it will work because they conform to the same API. So this example here, boards typically, boards typically accept at least three uh, components, something that inherits from abstract memory, something that inherits from abstract processor, and something that uh, inherits from abstract cache hierarchy. Abstract memory here, for example, might be a single channel DDR3-1600, or might be a single channel, a single channel DDR5-2400, to to it doesn't matter, the board will accept either one you want to use, and as long as it, because it conforms to the abstract memory API. And the same with the abstract processor, we have a sim, sim, simple processor, a switchable processor, cache hierarchy. For kind of, a, uh, we use cache hierarchy here as a very broad term, uh, in the standard library, yes, the cache hierarchy is pretty much anything that exists between the processor and memory in some capacity. So that's most of the cache hierarchy, but some other like minor little things. It basically the definition of how memory and the processor talk to one another. And the board itself kind of forms different things. The biggest example here is uh, the board is very specialized to the ISA you're targeting. So you have the x86 board and you have the ARM board, for example because these just require things to be set up so radically differently. So this is also how you define your API, uh, define your ISA you're uh, using. Uh, does anyone have any, we, we are gonna go to examples that will probably make this clearer, but does everyone understand the general like design methodology here? My, uh, my art, there's no one at the back there having questions? No, I just thought you were talking to someone. No, okay, question? Okay. Uh, uh, this just goes over things again. Board, the main backbone of the system. You plug components into the board. The board also does also things system level things like devices, workloads, etc. Processor connects to the board and have one or more cores. A cache hierarchy is a set of caches that are connected to a processor and a memory system. A memory system is a set of controllers and memory devices that connect to the, to to connect to the cache hierarchy. Uh, quick note on the relationship models. Um, C++ plus plus code in Gen 5 specializes parameterized models, typically referred to as sim objects in most Gen 5 literature. These models are instantiated in Python scripts. The standard library is a way to wrap these models in a standard API, what we call components. The standard library are pre-made Python scripts instantiating these models provided by Gen 5. So, we take the sim objects and we kind of wrap them in these things called components. I think the most helpful example here, which uh, I do use kind of every single time this comes up, I think, uh, a core is a sim object, but that's too fine-grained. It's too not of use to us. We care more about processors. They are more, they're at the level we can actually, we actually want to deal with things. So an example of a component would be a quad core x86 out of order CPU, and it is a four, it's an instance of four out of order cores connected together in a specific way that conforms to the x86 ISA, all wrapped into this component. Um, so you can think of it as like a, yeah, a higher level of, of abstraction than sim objects, uh, multiple sim objects, and how they're connected together. And from there on, you can connect components together into your simulated system. So let's get started. Um, if you go to uh, materials, O2, using Jam5, 01, starter lib, 01, components.py, you should see something already included here. One second, I'll leave. Oh, yeah, of course it's. Um, and if you want to play along, with what I'm doing, uh, you can do so. Uh, though I'm not going to wait up for people who clearly get left behind. If you want to, but don't worry because there's completed examples. If you go to materials or to using Gen 5 01 starting lib completed, I believe there should be a completed version of this. So, um, okay. So I'm going to up here. If this happens, just click start. Uh, by the way, your code space is always kind of saved. When you leave the browser, it's kind of paused on cloud, on GitHub. Uh, 
and you just connect re and you just reconnect to it. See, I'm back. Um, and I want to go using Gem Five standard library. Uh, I'm going to extend this one. Yep, so I'm just going to go from here. So remember, we said we just want to specify components and plug them into the board. Well, I'm just doing the first one. So if you remember, boards typically need three different components, cache hierarchy, processor, and a memory system. So let's start by defining our cache hierarchy here. I'm going to do cache hierarchy. Variable here equals mess uh, two level cache hierarchy. We've imported this somewhere up here, here. And uh, we're going to specify the parameters here. You can see our talent tent already is giving us all the parameters here. I'm going to fill this very quickly. L1, sorry, L1i cache, L1i size. That uh, L1 D associativity, so yep, so it's eight L1 I size, and that's 16k. By right, these should be on the slides as well, uh, so you can have two things that you can, if I go too fast, you can look up the slides and kind of see because that's what I'm reading off of here. Is kind of like my my notes to myself and what the coding examples should be. Um, I size L one I sensitivity eight. Finally, the L two size two five six kilobytes, and the L two sensitivity sixteen. And the num L2 banks and set it to one. So what we've done here is we imported this uh, cache hierarchy class. It's a messy two-level cache hierarchy. Uh, we'll talk more about the cache hierarchy systems on like, another day. But this is a two. This is a type of well, Ruby two-level cache hierarchy system. And here I've set uh, the L1 data cache, the L1 instruction cache, and the, the L2 cache. Just do these parameters here, that is us having defined our cache hierarchy system. Next, we need the memory system. We have your memory typically on just one line. So this we're going to do single channel DDR4 to 400. If you open, this takes size equals, uh, I'm going to set that. Oh wait, we don't actually set, we just keep it default. Um, this, uh, oh yes, I just uh, look at those here. Uh, the default for the single channel DDR3, DDR4, 2400 is eight, eight, 8 gigabytes. If we wanted, we could do, if we wanted to change the default on this, we could change this like one gigabyte if we wanted to. But I'll just keep it to the default. More, there's going to be more. There's going to be a whole session on memory, I think, either tomorrow or at some point, anyway. So that's coming up later as well. And finally, we want to create a processor. Um, to do processor. And we're going to use type simple processor, which I actually use quite a lot and, uh, in Gem 5. Uh, it is a processor that I broadly define as. Uh, n number of cores, all the cores are of equal type, but and uh, connected together and connected to the and, and 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 connected to the memory system. So here we've got a sim processor and the parameters we need to fill out here. Uh, CPU type, CPU types. This is an enum value, I'm saying. Let me set this to another example. Timing. This is, uh, we will go over this 
in, I think, at the near the end of this, but uh, your CPU type specifies, uh, well, it specifies the type of CPU, that's not helpful, but uh, how the model of processing the ISA that it conforms to, as well as the memory system. So timing, does timing access information, which is a type of CPU which models memory accesses, and there's also another one called Atomic, which uh, doesn't, which is faster. I don't know of more later, but timing is normally what you need to do if you want to model, uh, what it is what you need to do if you want to model, uh, if you want to get information on the time taken to access memory from the CPU, which is a very common thing to do. Uh, num cores is your number of processing cores. Let's keep it simple, we set it to one. And ISA is the ISA that you're using. And in this case, we're gonna say ARM. Let's make it an ARM processor. Uh, the other ones, x86, RISC-V, those are the big three. We also still support uh, Spark, MIPS, and that's probably what I'm drawing a blank on. I'm willing to bet none of you will ever have to use these for any purposes. They are kind of kept as a legacy thing. No one really uses these ISAs anymore. ARM, RISC V, x86 are the one, x86 are the ones that we really try to support and test to maintain. And if and that's all it takes to change my simulation. Although actually, there's one more way to change as well. But you know, it's very simple to move between ISAs and Gen 5. Uh, tomorrow or Wednesday, I can't remember which, I am going to talk about how the ISA specification and the processor kind of fit together in Gen 5. But for now, you specify at least in part here. So keep this arm. Now you just plug these into your board. We, we're going to use, we're going to plug this into what we call our simple board. And uh, so we're going to do board equals simple board. First, let's specify the clock frequency of this board. Okay. And then there's a property in each processor. We've already made one. Memory. Um, what was it? Memory. memory. Okay, I'll keep it with memory. I like that. Memory and uh, cache. Cache hierarchy. Okay. Um, the reason, this simple, I'm gonna go over this a bit more uh, later on the slides, but it's simple because it is, it is simple. It uses what we call SE mode, syscall emulation mode. The simple board essentially skips simulation of a lot of the, uh, well, it skips operation of the operating system. That's what, the, that's what the simple board does. And therefore it is actually incredibly simple. And one of the, uh, one of the actually advantages of this is it's actually ISA agnostic. You can actually run this with any ISA processor. So normally, if you specify an ARM processor, it has to plug in to an ARM board uh, because, yeah, you can't make a board that's generic enough for each ISA target. Simple board is so simple because you, and we're gonna, I'm gonna go over this in these slides soon, is can run any ISA. So set this up, okay. Right, now this comes back to your question, how do I specify the disk image and all the things we want to run? This is what this line does here. We're saying board dot set workload. And let's obtain resource arm gaps bfs dot run. What this does here is uses 
the Jam 5 resources uh, infrastructure. Herschel is going to present after me and talk about this in greater detail. But what Jam 5 resources is, is an online collection of resources which are things like disk images, binaries, uh, inputs, data sets that can be input to Jam 5, loaded in kind of more or less software or data into the memory system and then used to run the sim used to in part to run the simulation. So the um, insight to Gem the, the insight in Gem 5 resources is again it's very much like the standard library. We just had over and over again people were creating disk images for let's say an, uh, an Ubuntu 2204 disk image running the GAPS uh, benchmark suite. People were just creating these disk images all over the world constantly, so we just created it once, and you can then download it using Obtain Resource. And this one here is saying, get me the GAPS disk image for ARM and set it up so it runs the BFS benchmark. Uh, Jason went over this briefly this morning. And I'll same. How do I find out this magic string here, this magic key to download the right, the, the right resources? We have a web portal. Uh, I'm not going to use Chrome. Or no, not Chrome, this one. Um, Resources.gem5.org. And you can search for resources. So let's, I want gaps. I want an arm. And uh, what was the benchmark we said? I want to make sure I get the right keywords and show that this actually kind of works well. Yeah, BFS. Search. Uh, that's the binary. And here is the workload. Uh, run. The workload is used to run, to turn, to, to turn, it's just to run there. The gaps BFS binary in SE mode, and then it says what arguments are past that binary, uh, minus G10 and minus N10. Uh, and this downloads a binary and runs it. Cool. Um, so yeah, this is the way we obtain, in this case, a binary. Uh, I should also, I've been using the term disk image. Disk images are very common, but the, uh, in SE mode, you can just pass a binary uh, because it doesn't simulate the operating system. It just loads the binary straight into memory and executes from there. Yeah, this is more explicit. Yeah. Actually, that's probably 16 times. Oh, yeah, that's true. So I think there's a typo. I don't think that's in my original thing. Yeah, that was a typo. Um, this is more explicit. Um, next one is you're going to set up your simulation. Uh, via what I what we call the simulator, I kind of think of the simulator as like uh, it is what kind of drives your simulation, and allows you to control it. It doesn't specify the simulation; it allows you to control the simulation, stop it, start it, inspect it, look at it, get the statistics. It is like yeah, it's like the uh, the uh, conductor that is like getting everything kind of moving along. And it's quite a powerful thing. And it's actually one of the parts of the standard library which is uh, more easier to understand. So I just want to create a simulator here. And it's just a type simulator. And it takes in a parameter. There's lots of parameters here uh, that it can, but the only one that's really needed is it must accept a board, which we've already created. So let's just do board. Saying, OK, here's your simulator. You say, hey, simulator, here's a board. Get running. They said we're not going to run just now. You start, you actually run simulator. Don't run. If you remember before from Jason's example, uh, he had something like this earlier. I can't remember what the exact parameter was here. Uh, it accepts a parameter called uh, max ticks, which is like, don't execute anything past tick this. But if this is as it, it'll keep running until the simulation exits, which I'm also about to explain. Uh, OK. That there is an entire Gen 5 simulation. 
I can tell you that if we wrote this without the standard library components, without this, this, this function, and this, easily like 400 lines of Python. There's lots of sim objects that are being connected behind the scenes, behind the scenes here in the right way, and we kind of disguise it that way. Um, so if you want to run this, uh, again, uh, get your terminal open. Terminal, uh, it's just a new terminal here. Go into your directory, materials, two, or one, and then gem five, messy, uh, three one components. This is inevitably when it, it fails or not. Oh, did that put just execute? Okay, so I guess that answers the question. Capital K. So, so this is right. Yeah, okay. Okay, so capitalization does matter. Uh, sorry, that was my typo, I think. Right, I'm going to save. Save. Yeah. So um, you, Herschel, how long does this example take to run? A few seconds. A few seconds? Okay. Yeah, I didn't think it takes long. So um, you can see the output here. Um, first thing is it uses Gen5 resources, saying, hey, this resource isn't found locally. I'm downloading it, by the way. Nice thing with Gen5 resources is it caches everything it downloads here, roots.cache Gen5. And only if it download, only if it uses it from the cache once it's downloaded once, and then it runs a simulation. Yeah, we've got an output here. Uh, I know nothing about how this workload works, but here's the terminal output. Trial time. Uh, this might mean something to people who under, understand what gaps is supposed to be doing. But this is the output of the binary it just ran. Um, so that's, in SE mode, that's the terminal output of the binary. That can or cannot be of use, depending on what you're simulating. The real stuff, the real stuff that most people are interested in can be found in the uh, M5 out directory. So where did that, yeah, uh, here. If you go to M5, M5 out, dot stat. Oh, no, it's, oh, it's not, not the right one. Materials. You're right, yeah. Yeah, there it is, sorry. I was, I was working from this directory. I was working from all one standard library, M5 out. And this is the a dump made at the end of the simulation containing all the, well, it doesn't just contain statistics. It contains uh, the configuration specifications uh, and some other stuff that I won't go over, over really. This one's the one you want to really care about, stats.txt. Um, this is just a text file, so if you really want to find a statistic, I often find the best way is just to control F and look for it. Uh, but the, the nice stuff at the top here, so sim seconds, how many seconds did we simulate? Well, absolutely nothing, 0 0.009 of a second. Uh, the final tick value, uh, the simulated instructions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can go down, this file's huge, you can go down to just picking up. You can go to the Ruby cache hierarchy L2 delay histogram value for zero one, and it's this, you know, like, yeah. I'm gonna go over quite quickly the structure of the Gem5 standard library in terms of source code and how it's all organized, as I think it helps you understand the Gem5 standard library a bit easier in general. So I'm just gonna go through literally the source of Gem5 uh, via the Visual Studio code. Um, so if you Go to gem5, source, Python, gem5. All the gem5 standard library code is within this directory here. 
and uh, it's really, well, we'll go over these directories one by one. You've got the components, which contains all the components. And then subdivided into the components is uh, the boards, which I say you plug other components into. So you can see everything. Uh, there's abstract board here. And everything inherits from, every board inherits from abstract board. So one we used in our previous example was uh, where is simple board here. And simple board inherits from abstract board. Also inherits from this SE binary workload, but you can, we'll talk about that another time. We've got our x86 board, x5 board, ARM board, and some other bo boards here and there that help us run various Gen 5 simulations. Um, going down with cache hierarchies, which is the same. I'm going to go more, more, more into detail this, I think, tomorrow, if not the day after. Uh, there's different types of cache hierarchies in Gen 5, Classic and Ruby. I'll just dump into Classic for now. And you can see that there's a private L1 cache hierarchy uh, here. You see it accepts a L1D size and L1I size, and private L1, private L2. Uh, private L1, private L2, wash ca uh, walk cache hierarchy. Private L1, private L2, cache hierarchy. That's all organized into this directory structure. Memory is here. Uh, we have various types of memory system. Uh, we have uh, our normal memory system here. Uh, Multi-channel memory, sy multi memory systems are defined in here. That's where we cover our dual-channel DDR3 set setup. So, um, my, uh, you're going to go more over this on Wednesday, right? Or someone? OK, I thought we were talking about, yeah. Uh, by the way, our memory systems are defined in here. Uh, we have DRAM sys, uh, which requires you to compile in DRAM sys, uh, which I think we'll address later on in the week. Um, um, so this, allows, so this is how Gen 5 standard library is organized. I think the directory structure is quite intuitive. Uh, processors, finally, you have this. I think of note here is we also have these things called generator cores. Uh, generator cores are kind of like fake processors that don't really execute instructions. They just kind of bombard the memory system with uh, requests. And it's quite good. They're quite good components in Gen 5 when you just want to test memory systems with uh, a certain distribution of accesses. But you can kind of visualize for the function almost exactly like processors from the perspective of the rest of the system. Therefore, they conform to the processor API. Um, and traffic generator, same thing. Um, we have go out through components. We have pre-built stuff. This will probably be uh, filled with more stuff as Gen 5 evolves, but right now they are they're like exact. They are like boards that we've already actually put in all the components pre-made for you. Uh, the demo board example of one of them, the x86 demo board, is literally uh, you can just. It's already got. It's an instantiation of the x86 board, and you've already specified in the init what all the all the stuff is before. So you you don't even have to specify the memory processor and cache hierarchy. The demo board already has all this set up for you. So if you just do board equals x86 demo board, you're done. You just have to then specify the workload and do board and uh, instantiate uh, the, the, the simulator and do simulator.run and you're done. Um, this five matched. Uh, this is something that people at UC Davis worked on last year. It's a Gen 5 implementation of the Risk Five unmatched board. Uh, kind of like our trying to make a best uh, approximation of how that board works. So, going forward. So, I spent a little bit of time uh, focusing on just how processors work, and then we can move on to like another example. So,
Processors are a good example of the Jam5 standard library and how it's done, and also how we simulate uh, probably the most complex components in Jam5. Um, everything inherits from uh, abstract processor, but abstract processor in and of itself contains abstract cores and abstract cores. It's, I reckon going through this uh, kind of structure, this, uh, structure in your own time, but uh, essentially, sorry, I'm looking over notes here. Trying to see what I. So uh, I think the key thing to understand here is uh, processors are made up of cores, and probably the most useful one to you is going to be the base CPU processor. So base CPU processor means you can are collections of base CPU cores. So you could add, so you can instantiate from this. Um, so I'm just trying to think what's the important information to get across here right now. Um, I think uh, the powerful thing here that is going to come up soon and in other examples is you use a simple processor to quickly set up a processor like we, well, like we did in the last example. You can quickly up the number of cores. And if you want, you can use a special switchable processor type, which you can plug in in place of the simple processor, which allows you to switch out the core type on the fly. And um, what's the core type? The core type is um, core type is uh, defining how the CPU primarily the CPUs how the CPU interacts with memory. And there's really two types there: uh, timing, which uses timing accesses to memory which essentially means it models the time the CPU takes to request and get responses from the memory system, which means your processor is actually modeling memory system accesses. The downside to this is this model of processing is the model of simulating the processor is very costly. Um, it's because it requires considerably more operations. You need to schedule events in the future, and these events have responses and requests, et cetera. Uh, the alternative to that is the atomic mode CPU. And the atomic mode CPU is considerably faster, but it considers a request for memory access to be instantaneously re retrieved. I request, the, I request the value at address x. You immediately get it back instantaneously. And then it makes the simulation faster, but you're not really modeling memory accesses. Uh, I think the important thing to keep in mind here is you can switch between these two types of operation on the fly using the switchable processor to kind of move faster through some parts of your simulation and slower through other parts of your simulation. I think I should move this part to somewhere else in the tutorial because it doesn't really make set that much sense out of context. Uh, but I think the more I think to come across here is this is your Gen 5 standard library code, and uh, this is where it exists. Gen 5 resources code here. This is the API for interacting with Gen 5 resources. And uh, Gen 5 simulate. This is where your simulator code lives. So if you want to see how that's set up, you can look in here. So, we want to... so what I really wanted to get to is because um, what you really care about what you really, what's really going to matter when you do your own research is, OK, I can use a sound library to get my simulations 99% of the way there to what I want to simulate. But inevitably, you're researching something that we don't provide. Because if we provide it, someone's already researched it, right? You're wanting something like and you're a new component that does this. And I want to see how this changes the simulation output. If you're not doing that, you're not really doing research. You're doing something you're doing something that's already pretty much been discovered. So I think this is kind of important to go over. Um, OK, we've seen how to use the standard library components. How do, we, how do we get a new one? Again, this is another example of designed or an extension, an encapsulation, not modification. 
It's not really designed for parameterization. If you want to create a process, cache hierarchy, et cetera, different parameters, extend using the object-oriented design schematics. I'm going to go through an example on this. Um, but as a quick reminder first of the Gen 5 architecture, uh, here, we're, on our example, we're going to extend the C base CPU processor to create an ARM processor, which, which has a singular, it's got a singular typo there, a singular out of order core. That's what we want. For us. We want a processor, an ARM processor that has a single out of order core in it. That is going to be our goal of, goal of our exercise. Just a reminder, you have C++, models, or sort of sim objects. You can use these terms interchangeably here. Uh, Gen 5 has hundreds of them. And then via Python, they are kind of uh, specialized and parameterized and encapsulated into larger structures known uh, that we call components inside the standard library. So there's a good example of a, a cache hierarchy. And within the cache hierarchy, you have various subtypes like uh, L1, D1, L1, I1, L2. Processors, you have. Well, uh, processors, you have different types as well. Uh, yeah, I won't dwell too much on that, but uh, we went over that quite a bit. But yeah, Compon uh, components are higher levels of abstraction that instantiate the Gen 5 sim objects, normally collecting multiple, multiple of them together and defining how they interact uh, via APIs to other components. So uh, I'm going to code this, but if you go to materials O2 using Gen 5, O1 standard library live dash O2 processor, that thing there, we're going to work from here to build this processor that we want to build. Again, the processor will be an ARM, single core, out of order processor. It's going to work from here. We've already got a lot of code set for us here, but uh, it's not fully implemented. So just to look to see what we've got so far, we've, de we've declared something called my out of order core that extends base CPU core. And what we've done here is in the bare basics here of saying, of, uh, inst of passing the parameters to the parent, in this case, essentially saying this is going to be an ARM out of order CPU. I thought I was supposed to code. OK, never mind. Um, so uh, we've already given you the, uh, the core for this. So we've got a singular ARM 03 CPU core here. Because uh, the instantiation is quite simple. You just have to pass this object and ISA to the base CPU core. Um, start with this. So what's not implemented here is the actual processor itself. We've got some support classes. We, got, we've, we already defined the core here in advance, the my out of order core. And here is the processor, but we've not implemented this. This just does nothing important. So what I'm going to do here is we always start by defining our uh, initialization script. It's an if function. And we have these here, width, set the width of the fetch, decode, uh, Oh, and all these other uh, parameters, uh, the rub size, and um, inst regs, and then int regs. Uh, and here, we're just going to pass these to, well, we're going to pass them to the, sorry, and it's already defined what we're doing here. We will do the co cores equals my out of order core. So 
The base CPU processor, if you jump in there, which I guess, if you, if you right click, you can click go to definition and see it for yourself. It has a constructor which just takes in a list of cores. So when we specialize it in this way, we need to pass what we want to this constructor. And this is what we do here. We just literally create this, the cores you need. And here we're just doing a single core. So we're doing my out of order core. And we're passing whatever was passed. Well, we're giving this out of order core what it needs. Which you look here are these parameters. Which I don't think that's going to work, but OK. Jason, when do you pa when when do you, when do you ever use these weird third op sizes? This is what I don't understand about this example. Oh, this is this part. Right, that. Oh, just that that these these ones in there. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I was I did not understand the notes for this, but it's clear now. Um, so we just said it's gonna be one core. If we wanted two cores, we could do this. Like I'm just going to copy this. Um, sorry. I, I think that's all that would really be required in that case. Of course, the cores have the same properties, but we're just going to ignore that for now. We said single core. So it, it constructs a my out of our core. So uh, now that I think, so this, as it currently stands, creates an ARM O3 CPU. But we want to also be able to set the parameters within this ARM ARM O3 CPU with these width, rub size, number of int uh, registers, and number of. Uh, this doesn't have a parameter description, but uh, FP regs. I don't know what that stands for, but I assume it's an out of order parameter. Um, so here you would, here I'm just going to go through this. We do self dot core dot fetch width goes width self dot core. So if you look into base CPU core, it has a property called called core, and that core has these values which we're overriding with the values that we want in this example. And this is actually quite a lot of setting things to this width. with me. I mean, this is just here we've declared all these width parameters with the standard width parameter, which is passed via the processor to each of the cores. In this case, it's a singular core. And this is what we're doing. We're kind of overriding these values. We're specializing. We're creating our own sim object. And self.core num rob. Here we set these values to the rob, rob, 
rope size, the number of int registers, number of pulling point registers. And here we can style, here we also set the branch predictor. Uh, so here we decide what the branch predictor for this core is going to be. And we're going to say it's going to be tournament. Tournament BP. And finally, uh, Thank you. Uh, finally, we set the LQ entries and the SQ entries. Okay, did you say something? Okay, say, say that. Okay. Uh, and, uh, Thank you.